goodness sakes. Good morning, everyone. All right, that was a little bit better. Okay. And it's a beautiful Friday, and we're going to hear from a very interesting guest. So I am going to introduce Scott Moyer, and I'm going to read a brief bio here so you, can, you guys can know why he is being honored for his accomplishments today. Scott is a graduate of the class of 1981, played baseball and football here at North Penn. Upon graduation, he attended Millersville University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. He joined the Navy in June of 1985 and was commissioned an officer in October of 85. Completed Navy jet flight training in Beeville, Texas in September 87. Graduating first in his class, he was selected to remain in Texas as an instructor pilot in the TA-4J Skyhawk. In 1989, Scott reported to NAS Miramar, California, where he flew the F-14 Tomcat and completed two deployments aboard the USS Ranger, flying 42 combat missions in support of Operation Desert Storm and Southern Watch over Iraq. Scott reported to NAS Oceana, Virginia in 1984 for assignment as an F-14 instructor. During this tour, he was selected to join the Navy's elite Blue Angel Flight Demonstration Squadron. As a member of the Blue Angels, Scott was an ambassador representing the United States Navy and the Armed Forces, visiting children's hospitals, VA hospitals, high school and college ROTC units. Traveling over 300 days a year, he provided inspiration and motivation to many around the country and the world. Following his tour with the Blue Angels, he returned to the fleet and deployed aboard the USS Roosevelt. He was personally chosen to lead the Navy's first strike into Kosovo in support of Operation Allied Force. Under heavy fire, he successfully led a 24 aircraft strike and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross with Combat Valor. He was selected as the 1999 Atlantic Fleet Fight Fighter Pilot of the Year. In 99, the Blue Angel Angels suffered a fatal mishap and Scott was called upon to return to the team for the 2000 season. Following his second tour with the Blue Angels, he attended the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where he earned a master's degree in international relations and strategic studies. Scott was promoted to commander and assumed command of the Fighter Squadron 11 in 2002 aboard the USS George Washington. He flew missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and, I apologize, Falu Faluga? Fallujah. While in command, Scott was in charge of over 300 personnel, 18 jet aircraft, and over a $20 million budget. He was awarded the 2003-2004 Commander of Naval Air Forces Leadership Award as selected by his peers. In 2004, Scott deployed aboard the USS Carl Vinson as operations officer. He was personally responsible for the daily operation of the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier as well as the embarked air wing. Following 21 years of distinguished naval service, Scott retired from the Navy in 2006. He accumulated over 4,600 flight hours, 725 carrier landings, and flew over 80 combat missions. His awards include the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Meritorious Service Medal, seven combat air medals, and various other personal and unit awards. Scott continues to serve as a consultant to the Blue Angels, volunteers his time to support the Wounded Warrior Project and the Ronald Do McDonald House, as well as other civic and community organizations. He, is current he currently resides in Virginia Beach with his wife, Michelle, formerly Michelle George, MPHS Class of 82, and they have two children, Becca and Jake. So Scott, on behalf of North Penn, our students, faculty, and community, thank you for being here. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it appropriate to give a huge welcome to Scott Moore. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was awesome. Jeez, I don't know who that guy was on the, uh, on the paper. But uh, hey, North Penn, it is great to be here. And uh, as Mr. Bauer said, hey, Check it out, it's a Friday. School week's uh, just about over. It's third period, and we're not in class. We're here. We get to have a little bit of fun for a little while. So a uh, quick shout-out to, uh, to a couple of family members. I'm really glad that uh, um, my daughter made a journey up from Pensacola, Florida, escaped a hurricane to come up here and uh, be with us this morning. Jake took, uh, our son took a nine-hour drive uh, from Virginia. That's a, an adventure, a whole different story. Allison and Sarah, thanks for uh, coming here. And uh, everybody, thanks really uh, very much. It's, uh, it's just awesome to be here. So a whole bunch of years ago, I sat in those same seats, right? And I had no clue what I wanted to do uh, with my life. I was a 
uh, give myself a little uh, extra credit. I was an average student. In fact, the matter is I was probably a below average student, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I thought, well, maybe I'll give college a try. So I applied to uh, several colleges and got turned down by most of them. But I got accepted to Millersville University, so I thought, well, that's cool. I'll go there. And I just was a business major because I figured that would leave lots of options because I really didn't know what direction I was heading. While I was there and while I was growing up, I took some flying lessons and I learned to fly airplanes. And I thought, well, this is pretty cool. So when I graduated from college, uh, I talked to my dad and I thought, hey, this flying thing's a pretty good gig. Maybe we can make a career out of that. And he gave me some pretty good advice. He said, if you want to make flying a career, you really ought to look into the military. Well, I didn't know what the heck the military was when I sat where you guys are. I just figured the Air Force has planes, and uh, the Army probably has tanks. Uh, let's see, the Navy, they have boats. Uh, Marines, they run around on the ground and kill the bad guys. So, hmm, I'm not sure which direction I should go. Well, it turns out that the Navy has airplanes, too, and they land on aircraft carriers. And I thought, whoa, that sounds pretty exciting, sounds dangerous. Maybe, uh, maybe I could give that a shot. So I chop on down to Philadelphia to the recruiting uh, office, and they give me a test to see if I could be a pilot. And I was really, really lucky because I had good enough vision, good enough eyesight, and I passed this test somehow. And next thing you know, uh, I get started in Navy flight school. Well, that's quite an adventure, so they're going to teach you how to fly. I was lucky enough to get selected to fly jets. So before I knew it, I'm landing in a supersonic jet fighter on the back of an aircraft carrier in the middle of the night. And I'm here to tell you, there's not too many things that you'll do in life that are more exciting and stimulating than that. So uh, it's, it's pretty scary and it's pretty awesome. When I thought I couldn't get any luckier, I ended up getting selected to fly for the Blue Angels. And if you're not familiar with what the Blue Angels are, um, I got a video that we'll, that we'll show and it'll kind of outline a little bit about what the Blue Angels are all about. But basically they do the air shows all around the country and all around the world and represent the Navy and the Marine Corps to let folks like us know that there's people out there right now as we're hanging out third period uh, North Penn High School, landing on aircraft carriers in the middle of the night, uh, Navy and Marine SEALs hold up in a trench somewhere, keeping an eye on the bad guys so that we can chill out and have, uh, have the fun and the freedom that we have here uh, back home in the United States. So it's a great honor to represent them. And uh, hopefully, after we look at this video, you guys will have some questions and we can kind of chat a little bit because that's more fun than uh, sitting there listening to me babble. So, uh, so if we can cue, uh, cue up this video and it'll describe a little bit about the Navy and the Blue Angel and they, that whole experience. represent the United States Navy and Marine Corps and inspire the next generation of sailors and Marines. We are the Blue Angels. Based out of Pensacola, Florida, we are the world's first military aviation demonstration team. For more than 70 years, we've had the honor to serve our country as ambassadors of goodwill by bringing naval aviation to men and women of all ages across America. Our precision flight demonstrations showcase the professionalism, excellence, and teamwork found in all Navy and Marine Corps units, as well as provide the thrill and magic of flight to people each year. Since our inception, we've flown for more than 450 million spectators worldwide. In 1946, Admiral Chester Nimitz created a flight exhibition team to raise the public's interest in naval aviation and boost morale. 
In the 1940s, we thrilled audiences in the F-6 Hellcat and the F-8 Bearcat. During the 1950s, we refined our demonstration in the F-9 Cougar and F-11 Tiger. In 1969, we transitioned to the F-4 Phantom and then again to the A-4 Skyhawk in 1974. In 1986, we celebrated our 40th anniversary by unveiling the Boeing F-A-18 Hornet, which we still fly to this day. The Hornet's unique combination of high power and lightweight give this multi-mission strike fighter impressive maneuverability, climb rate, and acceleration, important both in combat and shipboard operations. You got six, boss. Boss. Squadron. Every flight demonstration starts with the walk down, demonstrating the military manner and bearing that is the cornerstone of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps. See you, fellas. See you, boss. Each show is a statement of perfection, with each team member performing a precise role to make up the carefully orchestrated demonstration. Check is one pressure on. Oh. Let's watch now as the boss takes the diamond formation skyward. The diamond formation is one of our most recognizable trademarks, a tradition from the earliest days of the Blue Angels. Next to launch are our solos. Blue Angel number five, the lead solo, performs a roll on takeoff with his landing gear still extended. Blue Angel number six, the opposing solo, unleashes the Hornet's dramatic climbing capability by accelerating his aircraft inches from the ground and pulling back on the stick, experiencing six times the force of gravity. The mission of every sailor and marine is the defense of our nation. Prior to being hand-selected to the Blue Angels, each member has earned the right to be considered an expert in their respective field and brings with them a critical skill set that has been perfected in the fleet. Blue Angel pilots must perform hundreds of carrier landings and accumulate more than 1,250 flight hours in tactical jets before they may be considered for our team. There is no greater American presence around the world than an aircraft carrier and the ships that accompany it, or a Marine Expeditionary Unit coming ashore. It is from this environment that future Blue Angel team members hone their skills to perfection. And it is here where they will return after their time as Blue Angels. Our team consists of 17 officers and approximately 100 enlisted men and women who exemplify the Navy and Marine Corps values of honor, courage, and commitment. In addition to the seven F-A-18 pilots, the squadron is led by an executive officer, an events coordinator, three C-130 pilots, a maintenance officer, a flight surgeon, an administrative officer, a public affairs officer, and a supply officer. Once selected, Blue Angel officers serve for two to three years, while the enlisted members on the team serve anywhere between two and four years. Beginning in November of each year, the team trains three new pilots. The Blue Angels practice for 10 weeks in sunny El Centro, California, flying six days a week, two to three times a day, and must complete 120 training flights prior to their first air show. It is during this intense training period, the entire Blue Angels team, both officer and enlisted, come together as one cohesive unit 
prepared to embark on the eight-month show season, performing approximately 70 demonstrations in 35 cities across America. of the Blue Angels is our maintenance and support team. Each new member is hand-selected from the fleet forces to represent the professionalism of the Navy and Marine Corps. They know not only their job from top to bottom, but also those of their teammates. This is the premier example of the teamwork concept, which is the defining characteristic of the Blue Angels. From sunup to sundown, our elite maintenance team works to ensure that every part of each aircraft is checked and rechecked. Our maintenance teamwork is so thorough that not a single scheduled air show performance in the history of the team has been canceled due to aircraft maintenance problems. Our maintenance and support team travels aboard the Blue Angels C-130 aircraft, affectionately known as Fat Albert. During each show season, Fat Albert travels throughout the United States and select countries, covering more than 100,000 miles and cruising at speeds in excess of 370 miles per hour. This versatile aircraft not only carries the specialized equipment needed to complete each air show, but it also amazes spectators with its size and agility. Flown by an all-marine crew, Fat Albert opens the show by displaying the tactical flight characteristics of the C-130 Hercules. Strike flying pallet from the cockpit. The Blue Angel C-130. Albert. At the end of each show, our team continues its precision demonstration on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, representing your United States Navy and Marine Corps, the Blue Angel. With a final salute and a handshake, another Blue Angel air show is complete, but our mission is far from over. One of the most rewarding aspects of being on the team is spending time visiting hospitals, schools, and community functions. At schools across the country, we take time to interact with students and discuss the benefits of military service and share our enthusiasm for naval aviation across the country hoping to inspire others to pursue their own dreams. Our hope is that tomorrow's leaders will be encouraged and motivated by what they see in our performance and all the men and women that make up our team. Honor. Courage. Commitment. We are the Blue Angels, representing all sailors and Marines who proudly serve this great nation across the globe. Say, that's pretty darn awesome. I can't even put into words what it's like to strap on that blue jet and soar up into the sky, fly upside down, 
350 miles an hour, flying close formation. That was number four. So in that video, I should have told you that before. You could have, like, you know, give some hoo-hoo for the, uh, for the four jet. So in the, in the diamond formation, I was the guy in the back uh, around all the metal. And some of the formations, some of the maneuvers that we do, we're as close as you guys are sitting together, and we're 350 miles an hour, uh, 100 feet off the ground. So, like, we'd fit in here probably. So uh, it's pretty incredible. A lot of teamwork. They talked about teamwork and a lot of trust, right? So I'm going to be uh, side by side with my wing in here and I have to trust that he's going to do the right thing and he's going to be professional and he's not going to be uh, uh, an inebriated or do something any uh, unpredictable. So it was, a, it was a great honor to, to fly those jets and we represent the guys that are landing on aircraft carriers and that's what we do before we get to be Blue Angels and that's what we do after we get to be Blue Angels. We go back out to the fleet to, uh, and represent the Navy and uh, go on deployment on the aircraft carrier. Pretty cool stuff. Anybody come up with any questions? I think we have a couple minutes if, uh, uh, if anybody's got any questions about being a Blue Angel or flying or, or life in general. What you got? Oh, hang on. I think he's going to bring a microphone yeah, we've, over. We've got a mic here, guys, so just uh, awesome. pass that down for me. Um, being a Blue Angel, do you still have to qualify with your rifle every year? Is that still um, no, not, not every year, although uh, we do qualify as, uh, in part of training. Uh, you pistol qualify as well as rifle qualify to, uh, to get a sharpshooter ribbon. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. You get to play with incredible toys in the military. And I'm not here as a recruiter, okay? That's not, uh, that's not, my, that's not my thing. But, uh, uh, but it is a pretty incredible experience, a great way to um, uh, you know, represent your country, and it's, it's pretty cool no matter what you do. We have... Uh, I didn't know that, but you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a dentist, you can work on engines, you can uh, work on computers. It's just, it's all out there. It's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool experience. Anybody else? Oh, good. Oops, hold on. I think, oh, go ahead. Where was I scared? <laughs> um, you know, it's really intense. Um, the only times that you get a little bit scared is when you're, uh, for me anyways, landing on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the night on a stormy night and the deck's pitching. And they showed a couple of shots of that. And uh, that uh, gets your adrenaline going pretty good. It's a little bit like if, I don't know, hopefully you haven't, but if you ever were in a car wreck or something like that, you go, oh, man, this is crazy. And I don't know who invented doing that stuff at nighttime. There had to be alcohol involved or something because uh, it's challenging enough in the daytime. And at nighttime, you come down. I remember very vividly my very first uh, carrier landing at nighttime. And you roll in behind the boat, and all you see is these couple of lights. And you're like, are you kidding me? And uh, bam, you just, you, as soon as you touch down, you go to full power. So that if the little tail hook misses the wires, you'll still have enough power to go around and fly away. And that does happen sometimes, uh, uh, whether you do it or sometimes it just skips over the wires. So uh, you're at full power and you go around. Well, when the arresting gear grabs the plane, even though you're at full power, and this 56,000 pound plane with these great big afterburner engines comes to a screeching halt, you know, and you're like, oh, all right. And then they, uh, you've come back, they raise the tail hook and they taxi you over and you go downstairs and have a hamburger. You're like, I do this for a living? You gotta be kidding me. Really cool. Go ahead, right here. Have they ever had the, uh, the tail hook fail? Uh, they have in the past, but now they've got such cool uh, engineering that it's so much better now. The, the catapult used to not be quite as reliable, and that used to kind of be a bad thing if it doesn't give you enough flying speed when you get catapulted off. But it's incredible. You're in this great big powerful jet, and when you get catapulted off, the, the little um, uh, nose strut thing that they showed a little bit of on the video, it grabs you. And it's like the power of God grabs this plane, and you give a salute, and whoosh, down you go. And next thing you know, you're flying. You're going 150 miles an hour from here to the back of the auditorium. And you're going, holy smokes, this is awesome. So it's just incredibly powerful. Go ahead. Uh, I have two questions. One, are you allowed to have glasses and be a pilot? Uh-huh. Okay, first question, are you allowed to have glasses and be a pilot? Yes, you can now. When I went through, you couldn't. You had to have 2020. Now, as long as you're correctable to 2020, you can be a pilot. And have you ever been to Selfridge Air Base in Michigan? I have been to Selfridge Air Base. Yeah, we did an air show in Selfridge, uh, Michigan. Absolutely. Yep. Love Michigan. Great state. Huh. Nice. Yeah. Did you go to the air show? Nice. You might have seen me fly. 96, 97, and then again in 2000. Um, do you still fly like now? Do, do I still now? fly now? I fly for Southwest Airlines, so that's really cool because I still get to fly airplanes, but it's not nearly as cool as that. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> but I couldn't have got to Southwest Airlines if I didn't do that first, and I'm really glad that I did because uh, if I just flew an airline my whole life, it wouldn't be quite as fulfilling as doing that stuff. I thought I saw another one over here somewhere. Go ahead. How long does it 
take to perfect the uh, formation? When you guys How long does it take to perfect the uh, formation? So they talked a little bit about it. We basically spend three months out in the desert, out in California, and we're going to start kind of far apart and a little bit higher up, and we're going to do one maneuver at a time, and we're going to keep practicing over and over and over and get a little bit closer and a little bit lower. And at the end of three months, hopefully we have an air show. And then throughout the course of the year, we're going to even get a little bit better and a little bit better as we develop more trust and more proficiency the more we, if we practice over and over. So by the end of the season, it's pretty cool. That's when we're flying about as close as you guys are sitting. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh-oh. Absolutely. And statistics tell you that the average student changes their major at least three times. Absolutely. So, given those facts and given your experience and your obvious immense success, what advice would you give these kids, many of which are on the college course, out of you school, at least next year? Yep. Um, so, not necessarily military related. But Absolutely. Life advice, what would you offer them? Yeah. Well, you know, I. When I said that, you know, somehow I went from those seats right there to those jets, which still blows me away, to be honest with you. But I think no matter what you do, you need to have a passion, right? You have to give it 100%. That's, that's kind of the bottom line in life. So no matter what you choose, I think if you just give all you've got to it, you'll feel good about yourself, right? So you, you don't have to join the military. That's not my point for being here or whatever. But um, no matter what you do, if you give your very, very best good things are going to happen, and the world is yours. You guys go to the coolest, you don't know it now because I didn't know it when I sat there, but you go to the coolest high school in the world, okay? When you guys get out of school and you go and you meet some other folks from around the country and around the world, not many of them are going to say that they have an indoor swimming pool in their high school, a planetarium in their high school. Like, you guys are crushing it. So the world is yours. You guys can do whatever you want, and it all starts right here. So uh, you have great opportunities out there uh, waiting for you, and, and I'm envious. Uh, you, guys, you guys have it all, so it's, uh, it's pretty darn cool. Uh-oh. You bet. Absolutely, yeah. So, so if you didn't hear it, can you describe any time that you encountered failure? Well, in my life, there's a, there, there was quite a few, actually. So uh, I mentioned in the beginning that I applied to a whole bunch of colleges, and I got into one. So when you get that rejection letter, don't let that deter you, okay? So you know, imagine there's a light on the wall over there, and you're just going to keep charging to that light. Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to knock me off my course. I want to go to college. I'm going to go to college. And that's, that's just that choice for me. But I got those rejection letters, and I got several of them. When I got selected for the Blue Angels, it was on my third try. So the first time I applied to the Blue Angels, I didn't even get an interview. I just got a rejection letter in the mail. I said, dang it, I want to be a Blue Angel next year. When the application process opened up, I submitted my application again. I had more flight hours. I was even more qualified. Nothing. Get a rejection letter in the mail. No interview, no nothing. So that was kind of humbling for me. Third time comes around, and the detailer, the guy that's in charge of where you go in the Navy, says, no, Scooter, you're too old, you're, uh, you're getting too senior, you can't apply. I said, dang it, I'm applying. So I submit my application, lo and behold, they give me an interview. I go down to Pensacola, and I sit at the end of the long table. All the officers interview you, and they fire questions at you, and they're going to pick your brain and figure out what you're made of. I came out of that interview. There were seven other folks uh, interviewing, and they were all studs. I mean, they're just they're tall, handsome, great guys. And I'm going, oh, geez. I knew two things. I knew that they knew who I was because I shot from the heart in the interview. I was totally honest with every question, and I didn't try and make anything up. And I knew they weren't going to pick me. Those were the two things that I knew. When I got that phone call telling me that I had been selected for the Blue Angels, it was uh, the ha oh, still get choked up. It was awesome. So. Uh, Setbacks along the way, and you just keep on plowing forward. And that's, uh, that's kind of the way it is in life, okay? So it's not about making mistakes. It's about learning from mistakes. It's about lessons learned and how you move forward after you get them. We all make mistakes. We all still make mistakes. And uh, you try and learn from it and become a better person. And you can learn something from everybody, okay? Sometimes you learn more from bad leaders than you do from good leaders because you might have a good leader, and you don't really even realize it. But then you work for somebody who's a crummy leader. Well, take notes and say, all right, I don't want to do that. And you can learn those kinds of things from everybody in life. So that's awesome. 
I have, uh, I think the bell's about to ring, and I'd like to give an uh, opportunity for anybody that wants to come down and uh, talk a little bit more of that opportunity. I'm going to give you one challenge, okay? One thing. This is, um, seems like it should be pretty darn easy, right? So one thing. Try and make the world a better place, right? Every day when you're walking around, you have an opportunity to make the world a better place. You see something that's not quite right, go ahead and fix it. You see a piece of trash on the ground, pick it up. You know, you make the world a better place. Tell somebody something nice. Compliment somebody, okay? How hard is that, right? That person might be having a bad day, going through a tough time. You might be the one that says, hey, you look nice today, and turn that person's day around, okay? One thing, how hard is that? So you go home and maybe you take out the trash for mom and dad without them even asking, okay? You unload the dishwasher, you do something good. You do one good thing each day, and you can make a difference. And when you lay in bed at night, you'll say, you know what? I did a good thing today. I did something nice. And if everybody does that, it really can make a difference. So uh, that, how hard is that? One thing, okay? When you, when, when you think about that as you finish up your day. Teachers, thanks so much for bringing your students this morning. That's really cool. And uh, you guys absolutely rock. Thanks for spending third period with me. And uh, if anybody has any questions at all, uh, please come on down and say hello. And uh, uh, I'm going to stick around for a couple minutes until the bell rings at 50-something, I believe. Six. All right, awesome. Anybody have any last-minute questions? We do have a couple minutes. Anybody? Uh -oh. Over here? You want the mic or can you shout? How many years do you serve at the pool? It's a two year tour. So uh, I was there in 96 and 97, and then you go back out to the fleet and to the real Navy. I got called back to the team in 2000, so I got to do it again for one more year. So I really got to do three years, but I got away with one. 21. Yep, 21 glorious years. It was awesome. There was one question over there before we wrap it up. Oh, can you bark it? Uh, the best part? Stay, you stand up and just... Best memory of basic training? It was uh, the very first day when the drill instructor comes down and you're sound asleep in your little rack. And uh, the very first morning, they start kicking trash cans down the hallway and this great big tall, I mean, it seemed to me like he was at least 10 feet tall. I'm sure he was probably 5'6". But um, Smokey Bear Hat, Marine uh, drill instructor, wears this uh, Smokey Bear Hat. He's got this big brass belt buckle and he starts yelling at you and screaming at you. Next thing you know, you're doing push-ups and sit-ups and things you never even thought, you know, and he's barking at you. And it's like 4.30 in the morning. I remember that was just pretty darn cool. I'm going, this is awesome. What a great way to start the day. It doesn't <laughs> get, sound awesome. Get, 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 getting screamed at and doing push-ups at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. We have one over here. <laughs> How much training does it take to become a pilot years-wise? Well, in the Navy, uh, they're going to train you, and it's going to take about two years from when you start to when you finish. And it kind of depends a little bit on which path you go, if you get jets or helicopters or whatever. But in general, it's, a, it's about a two-year deal. Yeah. Anybody awesome. else? Another one over here. I was a commander in the Navy. So, an 05, yeah. So, in the Air Force, they do it a little bit differently. So, that would be a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. Yeah, or the Marines. Let's see, the Navy and the Coast Guard do it the one way, and then the Air Force and the Marines do it, uh, do it a different way. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Awesome. Cool. Any ninth graders in the back? Musica. Mr. Berger, go ahead, shout for us. Use that radio voice. <laughs> I did, I was Scooter. Yeah, I was kind of called Scooter for uh, most of my life, and uh, fortunately it stuck in the Navy because there's some pretty crazy call signs uh, out there. Um, and, uh, of course, when the movie Top Gun, you guys are way too young. Has anybody seen the movie Top Gun? Hey, all right, you guys rock, awesome. Yeah, so, so the first guy that checked into our squadron after that movie came out, of course, his call sign was Maverick, and the guy in the back seat, his call sign was Goose, which is a little bit of a bummer, because nobody really wants to be called, well, nobody wants to be called Goose, plus, if you remember in the movie, Goose doesn't fare very well when the, when the plane crashes, so um, I was lucky I was uh, able to be called Scooter, and nothing, uh, nothing worse. <laughs> okay, last call for questions. Okay, last one, way in the back, one of my middle school guys, or junior high guys. Yeah. Have you ever experienced, like, like, air sickness after you land? Have you ever experienced air sickness? No, you know what? 
Some people do. Usually you get through it. The more and more you fly, you start getting used to it. Uh, so I had a really good friend who puked every flight in flight school, and he would just give the controls to the uh, instructor pilot, barf his guts out, and say, okay, I got it again. I'm like, I don't know how that guy did that, but he went through and uh, went all the way through flight school, and then he eventually stopped getting sick. But uh, I'm pretty lucky. I never got, uh, never got air sick. But I started flying when I was pretty young, so it was cool. Had that one figured out. Go ahead. Um, my favorite one, I wish, I wish we could show it again, but it was called the double farvel. So boss rolls upside down. I'm number four. I'm going to roll upside down. So you might, if you remember the one maneuver where two of the jets are right side up and two of them are upside down, that was my favorite because I'd flip over and there's the boss. And now I'd have to rendezvous on him and we're going to fly past the crowd at about 150 feet or so uh, upside down in formation. But it took a long time to figure that one out because I'd roll over and I would roll too far or not far enough and I'd be way the heck over here. I'd be like, well, how did I get here? Now how do I get back? Uh, so it took me a long time to figure that one out, but it was by far my favorite. Once you, once you kick it and uh, nail it a couple times and you start going, yeah, this is really cool. Okay, I think that's about all we have time for. And while the Blue Angels is obviously a very impressive accomplishment, I would like to ask the students and everyone else to thank you for your service as well, too. So give them a round of applause. Are. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was my honor. Okay, so, and after that, thank you. I also just want to thank you for the presentation, for entertaining our questions. I hope you got something out of this today. Uh, Scott is going to be inducted into the North Penn uh, Wall of Honor, or um, Lifetime Achievement Award, I guess it is, tomorrow night at time? Seven o'clock, so it's free admission. If anybody wants to come and see some of our uh, honorees, and Scott is getting the premier award tomorrow night. So one more round of applause for Scott Moyer, please. Thank you for joining us.